All right, so picture this. You're keeping a diary, right? Just your everyday thoughts, frustrations, and centuries later, bam. It's hailed as this profound work of philosophy. Talk about pressure. Right. That's exactly what happened with Marcus Aurelius in his meditations. We're talking about a Roman emperor ruling during this tumultuous time, yet finding the time to jot down these personal reflections on how to live a good life yeah. amidst, you know, the whole running an empire thing. And it's precisely because it wasn't meant for an audience that makes meditations so compelling. We're getting this raw, unfiltered glimpse into Aurelius's own struggles, his search for inner peace in a world that's anything but peaceful. So let's dive into that, those struggles. Today, we're tackling excerpts from meditations, trying to unpack how this ancient wisdom, well, how it holds up in our crazy modern world. Because let's be honest, some of it sounds pretty intense, right? Intense is putting it mildly. Yeah. But before we get into the nitty gritty, for anyone who's not a Stoicism scholar, which I'm guessing is most of us, what exactly is Stoicism? All right, so imagine a philosophy that's basically saying, look, life, it's going to throw some curveballs. It's going to throw some stuff at you that you just can't control. But you, you always get to choose how you react. That's Stoicism in a nutshell. Okay, reacting to those curveballs, I get it. Mm -hmm. But Aurelius takes it a step further. I mean, this is the guy who said, If it is good to you, O universe, it was good to me. What the turn of your seasons brings me falls like ripe fruit. Right. Talk about trusting the universe. Seriously. So he's not saying just accept whatever bad stuff happens and what, just give up? No, uh, not at all. It's about recognizing that some things we just can't change fighting against them. That's a recipe for suffering. The Stoics, they have this great analogy of a dog tied to a wagon. Okay, I'm intrigued. Lay it on me. So picture this. The dog, it can choose to resist, be dragged along, all that, or it can choose to run with the wagon. Uh, okay, so it's about going with the flow, in a way. Mm. Exactly. Not passively accepting everything, but choosing our battles. Like that frustration we feel when we're stuck in traffic, it's not going to magically clear the road, but we can choose how we react. Aurelius would probably tell me to enjoy the forced downtime, catch up on a podcast. Right. Because for Stoics, true freedom comes from focusing on what we can control our thoughts, actions, how we choose to respond to the world. All right. Makes sense in mm -hmm. theory. But then you get to this part of Aurelius's life that kind of throws a wrench in the whole Stoic thing. Mm -hmm. We're talking about a guy who lived through some serious loss, children, friends, even his wife. How in the world do you apply this whole acceptance thing to that? Right. This is where things get really interesting with Aurelius. Because he faces these heart-wrenching losses, these personal tragedies, with that same stoic mindset he applies to, well, ruling an empire. You'd think that kind of grief would shake even the most devout stoic. And yet, Aurelius writes, Fear of death is fear of what we may experience. Nothing at all or something quite new. That's a lot to process. To be honest, it sounds a little cold, especially for anyone who's experienced loss firsthand. It definitely challenges our usual ideas about grief, right? But I think it's important to remember, Aurelius isn't saying we shouldn't grieve. It's more about perspective. Like, mm. he sees death as this natural part of the universe, something that happens to all of us. And true peace, even in sorrow, comes from accepting that. Okay, so bringing it all back to us here in the present day. We're not Roman emperors, but we've got our own struggles, our own anxieties. What are we supposed to take away from all this? Mm -hmm. Should we be walking around quoting Marcus Aurelius pretending like bad things don't bother us? Huh. I think we'd all be terrible actors if we tried that. No, meditations, it's not about suppressing your emotions or turning into this, like, unfeeling robot. Think of it more like you've got this toolbox, right? And inside are these tools for building resilience. Just like Aurelius used Stoicism to deal with ancient Rome, we can apply those same principles to our modern problems. So if work deadlines are my personal Roman Empire, you're saying? Exactly. Or social media pressures, or just, you know, the daily grind. Aurelius reminds us, no matter what life throws at us, we always have a choice in how we react to it. It's less about pretending everything's perfect and more about finding that, that inner calm amidst, well, the chaos. You got it. And honestly, that's a pretty powerful tool to have in your back pocket, wouldn't you say? Absolutely. Makes you wonder, what would Marcus Aurelius make of our modern world with all its complexities? Well, he did find solace in this idea of a harmonious universe. Something to think about as you reflect on his meditations. What gives you a sense of peace, a sense of purpose, even amidst all the chaos? We stand so facing the storms. We won't fall with wisdom in our minds. We find our way Just to see our hearts will never sway Like the souls we carry on Courageous and strong We'll ride the road Temperance in our choices We keep control
and forevermore No need for excess The simplicity we find Joy in every moment Leave the rest behind I'm breaking the songs we carry Challenges with a steady gaze Stoic wisdom lighting up our days Hey, And it's slow we stand tall and true Unshakable, unbeatable, me and you Unbreakable souls we carry on Courageous and strong, we'll right the wrongs Temperance in our choices, we keep control Notion that life is is there and you're just going to live it, versus embrace it, change it, improve it, make your mark upon it. What do you really, really want from your life? If you had no limitations, if you had all the money and all the time and all the talents and all the abilities, if you could do or be or have anything, what would you really want in your life? <laughs> yeah, there comes a day, man. Everyone's going to have this day. There comes a day where being average, being mediocre. It's just sickening to you. It's just sickening. It makes you want to throw up. Because you've seen people with far less talent than you. As you're growing up with them, their childhood buddies, whatever else, they didn't have what you had. Yet now they're fucking to become something that you haven't. There comes that day. It's either when you're young, you know, and, and it strikes you on the baseball field because you're sick of striking out. Or it's, it's when you get fired from your fifth job, you know, and your wife and kids are on your ass because you don't know how to support them anymore. There comes a fucking day where push comes to shove. Where being mediocre, being like average and shit just fucking burns. It sucks so much. You can't deal with it one more day and you get off your fucking ass and you create something it's always been there it's always been inside of you trying to come out but you've never wanted to unwrap it because it's too much fucking pain and commitment you were scared you're gonna fail you're scared if you started you never finish it you didn't want to tell anyone about it you knew it was there but you never wanted to embark on it get success remind you what you could have been and then the fucking spark is born get success remind you what you could have been and then the fucking spark is born and no matter what happens, I'm never going to be in this boat again. And you get up and you go, even if it gets knocked down, you just keep going, keep going. You're a wild man. And life has never been so sweet. That can happen at an early age. It can happen at a later age. It's going to happen to somebody, every, you know, no matter what's going to happen to you. Remember, you've survived a lot and you'll survive whatever is coming. Very little is needed to make a happy life. It is all within yourself, in your way of thinking. Sapere Aude, dare to know, Horace. Always save a little money every week or month. Nothing gives you happiness like a financial buffer, believe it or not. Only if you punish the truth, expect to be lied to. The most basic condition for happiness is freedom. Here we do not mean political freedom, but freedom from the mental formations of anger, despair, jealousy and delusion. As long as these poisons are still in our heart, happiness cannot be possible. Tish Nat Han Guess how long he would try to get me out. You're right, as long as it would take. That is a friend, someone who would come and get you. 
Now, I also have some casual friends who would probably say, call me when you get back. I guess we all have some of those friends. But friendship is so vitally important to those in search of the good life. Make sure your friendships get the attention and the effort they deserve. Properly nourished, they will give back to you that priceless treasure of both pleasure and satisfaction called the good life. And remember, the good life is not an amount. The good life is an attitude, an act, an idea, a discovery, a search. The good life comes from lifestyle that is fully developed, regardless of your bank account, so that it provides you with a constant sense of joy in living and fuels the fires of commitment to all of the disciplines and fundamentals that make life worthwhile. The first thing you start changing is what? Your philosophy. You start changing your mind. You start changing how you think. You start picking up new ideas and information. Gather new knowledge. Make better decisions about what's valuable. And I'm telling you, if you'll do that, your whole life will change. Your health will change. Your relationship with your family will change. Your ability to cope with challenges and problems will change. I'm telling you, income, promotions, all of it will change. If you will change, it'll all change. If you won't change, it isn't going to change. You can keep your fingers crossed if you want to and hope they'll straighten it out. You can wish for the wind not to blow quite as severe, but I'm telling you, Wishing for the wind to change in your favor, I mean, we call naive at best. Don't do this any longer. Wish for a better wind. The key is to wish for the wisdom to set a better sail. Utilize whatever wind that blows to take you wherever you want to go. That is the philosophy I picked up at age 25, and it revolutionized my whole life. And here's what I found. I found it was easy. I got rich by the time I was 31, and it was easy. They kill me. They cut my flesh. They persecute my person with curses. What then? May not thy mind for all this continue pure, prudent, temperate, just, as a fountain of sweet and clear water, though she be cursed by some stander by, yet do her springs nevertheless still run as sweet and clear as before? Yea, though either dirt or dung be thrown in, yet is it no sooner thrown than dispersed, and she cleared. She cannot be dyed or infected by it. What then must I do? that I may have within myself an overflowing fountain and not a well. Beget thyself by continual pains and endeavors to true liberty with charity and true simplicity and modesty. When a person spends all of his time in foreign travel, he ends by having many acquaintances but no friends. People are great at keeping secrets they don't know. Noli nocera, do no harm. Latin phrase, Hippocratic Oath. Most people are a complete waste of time. Don't listen to the malicious comments of those friends who, never taking any risks themselves, can only see other people's failures. Sometimes people don't want to hear the truth because they don't want their illusions destroyed. Friedrich Nietzsche Isn't that fascinating? I don't know what she told her buddies when she went back out there. But she might have said to them, well, my daddy won't let me go anywhere. He won't let me do anything. That doesn't make any difference. I believe that she was ahead of the game because of it, and I believe that we were ahead of the game because we would not let her do that. Self-image is so important. I want to read something here that is so important that I didn't want to take a chance on just verbalizing it and not communicating exactly what I wanted to say. The person with a poor self-image doesn't move successfully into management. He fears rejection by the people over him, under him, or around him. He often steps out of character and dons one of four ill-fitting masks. He tries to be good old Joe and assures his subordinates that nothing has changed. He desperately tries to be one of the gang. 
Second, in his fear of rejection by his former peers, he makes concessions and exceptions that go beyond the principles of good management. Sometimes he does the opposite and takes an arrogant, I have arrived approach, which causes resentment among his former peers. Third, he may be unduly concerned about his relationship with management, and in his anxiety to please, he becomes too servile, eats too much humble pie, and seeks too much advice. He has an exaggerated fear of failure because he sees his worth in terms of never failing. Ironically, this fear of failure causes him to hesitate too long before taking any action. This unrealistic hesitancy is often the cause of failure. Fourth, the manager with a poor self-image may assume a... How from the fact that we are akin to God, a man may proceed to the consequences. If the things are true which are said by the philosophers about the kinship between God and man, what else remains for men to do than what Socrates did? Never in reply to the question, to what country you belong, say that you are an Athenian or a Corinthian, but that you are a citizen of the world. For why do you say that you are an Athenian? And why do you not say that you belong to the small nook only into which your poor body was cast at birth? Is it not plain that you call yourself an Athenian or Corinthian from the place which has a greater authority and